I think we can start. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Milica Pesic, I am Executive Director of Media Diversity Institute. Um, it's a, an organization based in London and uh, our starting point for whatever we, are, we, we have been doing since 1997 is actually to promote one of the basic principles of diversity and its inclusion. And we believe that good journalism, as Aidan calls it, or responsible ethical journalism, um, has to be as inclusive as possible. And that's what we are trying to do. We are a very practical, pragmatic organization. We provide a lot of training, hands-on training, and uh, we work with journalism faculties as well, pushing for practical modules and courses um, uh, where journalists, journalists and students really learn how to, techniques how to, to be inclusive. Um, this session is actually about what the industry is doing to respond to, to the, the challenges of, of, of hate speech and xenophobia. Um, I have changed slightly the, 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 the order of, of my speakers, my panelists. I thought it would be good if we start actually with the presentation of Mediva project because um, my panelist Irina Ulasiuk, uh, Ulasiuk uh, is doing this study and it covers the whole European Union based on six countries, so she can give us a, a little framework and then we can have people coming directly from the industry to tell us how they are dealing with the issues. Um, I'm going to be tough in my feminine way, unlike uh, Tarlac, so seven minutes presentations uh, and then there will be, I hope, enough time for really contributions from, from you um, that we can really have a, have a discussion. So, um, Irina, who is, who that, who's done actually her PhD here is, uh, at the European University Institute and now running this study. Irina, please. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present the project. The Mediva project is one of the projects that has been run by the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies and it deals with uh, the assessment of the media capacity to promote uh, migrant integration and to, to promote diversity. So what is the fuss about? Why sh shall media promote uh, immigration, actually, immigration topic? So let us have a look at the statistics from 2010. Nearly 50 million foreign-born people resided in uh, uh, the European Union. Two-thirds were born outside the EU, and one-third was born in a member state other than the member state of his or her residence. And the foreign-born actually accounted for nearly 10% of the total EU population. This basic data suggests a significant ethnic and cultural diversity within the EU countries. So we do believe that um, the media have a role in, to play in promoting this diversity and in fighting the existing negative stereotypes because the media actually determine what will be news and they do not just passively report the news, they select what is to be covered. So I would like to um, uh, share with you the results that we have obtained uh, um, in the Mediva project on the news making practices that um, are taking place at the moment in six European countries. So we have done uh, the overview of the existing research and also conducted uh, 68 interviews with uh, senior journalists and media professionals in six European countries, Italy, UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Poland and Greece. So if we uh, ask ourselves what constitutes news when migrants are concerned, so on the first hand, we can see that migration news is like any other type of news event driven. We see that migration news is a reaction on what is going on at the moment. And uh, we also see that migration news depends on what makes um, actually uh, a story from the newsroom, on the extent to which this or that piece of news is found meaningful by the editors. As one of the journalists said, if the editor-in-chief or uh, the director sees no interest to it, then it doesn't, the news just doesn't play. So 
uh, we have seen that uh, to become news, a migration story has to meet several criteria. So it has to be spectacular. Events which are not pictorial in nature are just neglected by the media. Migrant news must be interesting, important, and of high visibility, challenging to people, and sudden. It must be news that touches the society, changes everyday life, and impacts on the overall situation. Migration news has to attract public attention, and it must sell well. Even more importantly, a migration news has to attract public attention, as Andrea said, it has to sell well, and it has to also be, uh, it also has to have the so-called national component itself, because migration news tend to objectify certain migrants, and they would like them to fit certain patterns, and they have to be portrayed through the eyes of a homogenized national type. One of the journalists said migration news is good news if it is bad news. So what we have here is that economic interests of the media and the current political agenda in many European countries create a bias pushing the migrant-related news towards sensationalism. As a result, we see that there is a disproportionate uh, coverage of events involving migrants in episodes of crime, violence, conflict, scandal, and scares. Migrants are often perceived as a um, bad thing. And this is especially the case in those media whose agenda is migration sells newspapers. This is, for example, the case when we look at the common journalistic practice to mention the national origin of a person who has committed a crime. When migrants are concerned, news can be anything that is shocking, anything that goes along the lines migrants are swapping the country. Immigration is often perceived as an unfair concurrence and migrants as nothing less as destabilizers of the labor markets of the host countries. Headlines often speak for themselves. More unemployed British people than foreign-born, for example. Migration is also viewed as a security problem with stories of migrant involvement into crime, prostitution, black market, for example, foreigners breaching visa regimes and committing homicides. Immigration is also seen as an economic problem with migrants being intruders into the welfare of the receiving countries, for example, migrants receiving social welfare payments in the middle of a recession. Or it is sometimes viewed as a health problem for example, foreigners are using the health system for free, or AIDS is seen as a disease threat to public health brought by immigrants, or it is seen as a conflict of cultures issue. Most frequently, anti-immigration rhetoric, alarmism, and consequently a constant drain of hostility are being used consciously. And uh, it comes at no surprise that local populations may blame migrants for taking their jobs or for jeopardizing their security and welfare. We can thus assume that many of these discussions are based on emotions and false perceptions about migrants that the media encourage by omitting their voice or on the other side of the story that is normally full of abuses, desperation, violent acts at uh, the hand of the police or criminal organizations. Interestingly, the coverage of um, mm -hmm. migrants can be in two extremes. It can be very negative or it can be too uh, positive so it becomes unreal. So we have uh, advocated the balanced approach to the problem. Uh, as far as the perspective of coverage is concerned, we have also seen that, as Aidan White uh, has mentioned, uh, migration use is very much dependent on the political agenda. However, it also depends uh, on the uh, general line a media outlet is pursuing. It depends whether a media outlet uh, liberal, critical toward chauvinism or nationalism, or on the other hand, is just driven by the desire to sell more um, in newspapers or to have a broader audience. So we have also seen that some journalists uh, do indeed cover news out of the political agenda. 
And we have seen that uh, although they might cover this uh, um, issue, there are some challenges that still remain. Migration news remains episodic. Migration news becomes an issue only for a while and then it is soon forgotten. Migration news tends to be sporadic and it's never regular. The surges in coverage of migration news condition the public and policy makers to think of immigration as a sudden event, usually with an air of crisis. Immigration topic, in our opinion, must be covered in a more continuous, consistent and regular way. <clears throat> and for example, a uh, good practice example can be given from an Irish um, uh, public broadcaster who has committed itself to produce a series of six to eight programs annually on multiculturalism, including migration issue. So we have analyzed also different sources of information. We have seen that on many occasions it is just the news agency that is a primary source and not the migrants uh, themselves. While uh, we have also seen that there might be problems with the migration sources as well. Some conclusions. The ethnic and cultural diversity in European societies is not properly reflected in the European mass media. While positive trends do exist, the issues of migration and integration are incorporated in mass media news product under the general conceptualization of clash of civilizations. The media tend to highlight controversial and conflict aspects of migration rather than opt for well-researched, investigative and substantial reports of the social context of the relevant news occurrences. That's what um, Aidan White actually has mentioned as well. And uh, media continues to represent immigrants negatively, while interesting subjects occur, which occur um, are nearly omitted. Even when positive reporting does occur, it tends to be represented as the exception to the rule and reflects processes of cultural assimilation with migrant individuals portrayed as successful and socially integrated. The concern that migrant voices are not heard enough remains and media outlets do not cover immigration as a topic continuously. So the only, um, we have already mentioned that and I think that it might be an interesting point for discussion, uh, present day various uh, social media effects uh, on the way migration problem is presented, I think we can discuss that later. Irina, your study is available online. Yes, yes the study is available in online and I can also say that this is just part of the study. We have prepared four thematic reports, so on newsmaking practices, on recruitment training, and also on the, on the content analysis, uh, the representation of migrants. Uh, so the, uh, all the, the reports are available, and also I think that for journalists it also might be interesting that uh, we will be soon presenting on the website the tool a kit of uh, media indicators that enable a mass media outlet to assess their ability to present uh, diversity. Thank you, Irina. This was a I think it's now perfect actually to move to, to industry. We have uh, Anne Adem from Norwegian uh, Public Television. Uh, she's the executive editor of Oslo Branch. So, Anne, um, first question for you, does this apply what we heard from Irina to the Norwegian television? And the second question is, after the, the massacre of 22nd of July, um, there were reactions from media in Norway you want to talk to us about, and I'm sure everyone will come with the examples, or can come with the examples from your own media, how you covered the, the, the massacre. So, Anne, please. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It came down suddenly on Monday and I jumped on it because I believe this is a very important topic. Um, uh, this is not an ordinary uh, PowerPoint presentation. I just put together um, some very strong images uh, which I think um, reflects uh, some of the dilemmas concerned the 22nd of July in Norway. Uh, if you ask any Norwegian uh, what he or she did the 22nd of July afternoon, they could give you the answer. They know. It is a very, very important moment for us. I, me, myself, I was uh, at the south, south coast sailing 
uh, when we came to the port, uh, we were able to recharge our cell phones. My cell phone was full with uh, messages and desperate phone calls from family and also from work, of course. Uh, from my family, where are you? Are you safe? From my daughter, are we in war? What has happened? Um, and this, uh, uh, this event, uh, in many ways, changed Norway. Uh, we usually, uh, this weekend we had a big journalistic conference in, us, in, in, uh, in Norway, uh, investigating journalists, where we were kind of also discussing this topic. I'm, I was here, but I read online what happened, and uh, there has been many thoughts after, um, after the, um, the event and also what's coming, uh, coming forth now with the trial and everything. Uh, the image I'm going to show you now is not for public. Uh, it's, um, it's a Swedish press photogra photographer who won several prizes. Uh, they're not published in Norway because um, uh, you can see why. Uh, let me see now. How? There it is. Uh, because it can show, it identifies the bodies on the island. I think it has been um, published in Sweden, but blurred out, I think. Uh, you can find it online, but it never found it in Norwegian newspapers. This is also a very special moment. The police arrived. One of the things uh, we, they were discussing on the conference is how Norwegian media acted uh, uh, towards investigating what happened. Um, actually, lots of faults has been made by the police. The, Norway wasn't built handling a disaster like this. Uh, we are kind of a innocent, naive country in many ways. Uh, so the police, they came too slow. He could have been stopped a lot, lo a lot sooner than he was. Uh, it took them too long time. And we were kind of careful investigating on that, on that thing because uh, we kind of uh, wanted to be a little bit careful those days after the 22nd of July. Uh, I was leading the news work in our office the following week. Uh, I think the most challenging week of my life, uh, being a journalist, filled with ethical discussions and very, very difficult things. Uh, these are same, uh, some of the victims. Uh, as you can see, uh, he was not a racist. <laughs> he took them all. The youngest one was 14. Um, and there were also some grown-ups. He said afterwards that he didn't want to kill them, uh, those who were younger than 18, uh, because he thought uh, by the age of 18 you're uh, responsible, but he killed down to 14 years old. Um, and this really struck us hard. Uh, this is from a mass demonstration a couple of days after uh, it's outside the city hall of, Nor of Oslo. Uh, all over the country there were, uh, I don't know, I think perhaps, probably something like a million people out on the streets. Um, um, those kids who were killed were the kids who were um, sitting around the bonfires, singing. Um, they were fighting against war. They were still ideologically, um, uh, idealistically. They wanted to save the world. They were th our future. This is members of the royal family, and uh, those tears are real tears. Now, this is one of the... Uh, one of the kids who were killed on the island. Her name is Banu Rashid. She became 18 years old. Her, um, her uh, biggest ideal was Gru Harlem Brundtland. You may know her. She was our first female prime minister. She was al also an environmental mi minister. And she later uh, was leader of the World Health Organization. Uh, she was buried outside Oslo in a little wooden church. Uh, the, her parents uh, came from Kurdistan. They were Muslims, but they wanted to give her a funeral uh, in her spirit. So that's why they arranged a funeral uh, inside the church with both an imam and a priest. And I think this is perhaps one of the most lovely images 
um, in the aftermath of 22nd of July. Uh, the ceremony inside the church was um, uh, a mix of Christian and Islamic ceremony and um, in front of the coffin, the priest and the imam. We have done some research in Norway uh, concerning the xenophobia um, after 22nd of July and um, uh, actually uh, it's a little bit um, um, uh, not disappointing but um, what's the opposite word? Hope for encouraging, yes, sorry. Um, because actually xenophobia is a little bit going down. Uh, what we can see is that the xenophobia in Norway is, biggest, uh, is at its biggest in the rural areas where no people with minority background lives. Uh, as in Oslo, where the majority lives, it's the least. So what are we going to do about those folks? Um, the mass murderer who is still in Norway, we don't like to say his name. Uh, we don't want to give, uh, to add up to his fame because of course he's searching fame. Uh, he got some of his ideological inspiration from web pages like this. And I think one of the, um, uh, one of the things that has happened in Norway after the 22nd of July is a growing awareness that we have to, uh, as individuals, as uh, we have to uh, take responsibility. And th uh, there are several, uh, I like to call wormholes, uh, where you have uh, very, very nasty discussions going on, very bad uh, things going on. And uh, people like myself have always kept outside it because I don't like it and I think this is just something for them. Uh, but I think it's been an awareness that we sh uh, this is a personal responsibility. And of course, a responsibility for the press uh, to show the stories that is not only uh, about uh, groups, but it's to tell the stories about the individuals. Me, myself, I'm a Norwegian, Christian, white. I do not we want to be put in the same group as the mass murderer. And so not, do not the Muslims in Norway either. They don't want to be put in the group as um, Al-Qaeda, for instance. And what are we going to do about this guy? Uh, 16th of April, uh, the trial starts in Norway. It will be a big circus. Hundreds of journalists coming from all over the world. There will be live broadcasts every day. Um, the first week is put off for his testimony. Uh, this is from the first open uh, here, open public, open tr um, prison meeting, where we will allow to take pictures. He's doing a, a right-wing um, greeting, some kind of extremist greeting, and um, he is clearly uh, searching fame. So how are we going to deal with that? Thank you. Well, there, there, has been, there have been already discussions whether transmitting the trial is, is a way of promoting the hate speech he is going the, the, you know, to, to use, but we leave it for a discussion later on. Just to inform you that I've been told by the organizers we can go on till 1.30, so whatever the previous session took, we, we can now compensate for it. Um, uh, my next panelist is uh, uh, Claire Frochon uh, from France, uh, who is a media expert, particularly in, in diversity issues, who's written several books on these issues, uh, not only on the situation in France, but in Europe, and who's worked for French 3 television, um, and very much expert in, in the issues of how to deal with hate speech on practical level in the industry. I hope that Claire would uh, tackle uh, what's been happening in Toulouse and how the media in France actually reported. And one maybe question to, to raise here, we heard from Slovakia, if I understood well, that actually the media took the side of the killer in case of seven people being killed. Daniel, is that the case? Yes. <laughs> 
so it would be just interesting to see how the media in France have been portraying the, the killer in, in Toulouse. Um, so, Claire, please. Uh, thank you, thank you Milica, and thank you for the organizer for this interesting invitation. Uh, well, um, as Melissa says, so I'm now an independent consultant. I worked before as a journalist on French television, but on current affair news. I was never working just for the news. Um, so I, to say I took some distance with uh, this kind of journalist. So it will be, what I will try to do is to give you some very uh, quick and superficial observation of those last days in France. Um, and my main purpose is to, to, to look at how cautious and careful the journalists and the media have to be covering such news which pose so many questions and also controversy in the context of uh, multicultural society in France and uh, in all Europe. And if I have time, I would like to, to have some recommendations as well. Uh, so this Toulouse terror, of course, there was such emotion, um, especially at the beginning. We didn't know what happened. And at the beginning, there was a parallel which was done with what happened in, in Norway. Um, I think it could be a real good example to look at how difficult it is today to treat and to discuss such a dramatic news during uh, a, this traumatic week, and especially less than four weeks before the presidential election in France, which is a, a pre-ethnic society. So it's, I, one of my observations is and recommendation should be how important and necessary it is to study later on, especially the specific role of the news channel, the live channel on satellite. And first of all, uh, the channel called BFM Television, which is a private satellite China, and which got an incredible audience this week. Uh, we could notice uh, what we call in French a dérapage, a kind of slipping, a live slipping uh, on television. This, it was a kind of false scoop given of Mohamed Merah, the killers, and saying he was arrested. And this was given on Wednesday, so one day before, in fact, he, was, uh, he died. And this was given on this television by a special correspondent. It was given on the phone. And, so, and it took two hours to just to say no. It, was, it, 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 it took two hours to the channel to deny this fact, to deny this scope. And during those two hours, there were other television, like public television, which I think is it's very, it's quite dangerous, and other uh, news television, who took back this fact and telling it come from police sources. The sources came from the police. So I think this is quite, uh, I was really amazed to, to look at this, and even if, uh, you, you know that uh, kind of sleeping when it's a direct, indirect, it's sometimes difficult. But it has to say how difficult it is not to be able to have the verification of the sources you get. And what happened too is on the, this television, on the same time it was denied, but at the same time there was on the bottom of the screen, there was still a, a bandeau, there was something telling that the, the killer has been arrested. It was not on the conditional, it was a present. So you know, there was such a big confusion between what was, what you could see on the screen and what was given, the news which was given. So I think that it was just a, an example I wanted to give to you. Um, so no time given to verification with this kind of information, continuous information need to talk permanently, you have permanently somebody who is talking, 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 just to feed the screen. You don't have images or you have the same images during hours. And it's really ad nauseum. For me, it was a kind of uh, nauseum. It was, I think, quite, quite dangerous. Another observation I could do is the role of the experts. Uh, in a newsroom which is dominated by speed and quick blog posts, there is a need for in-depth analysis, 
by contributors, but contributors who come from the diverse perspectives and disciplines. Um, this, could, this was really done by some uh, daily newspaper like Le Monde or Libération or even Le Figaro. Uh, but on television, on mainstream television, uh, public, on private or on news television, you could see always the same three or four experts in crime terrorists. So I think it's very important to have other voice to look at diff, di diverse sources. And I think it's one uh, with the expert and it's one of the danger of television. Um, another observation I, I could have was the precision, the precision which was given on the headlines of several media to the Algerian origin of Mohamed Merah, the killer. As soon as you know that he, so he, he was a suspect, um, there was this Algerian origin which was given in the headline. In fact, Mohamed Merah is French. He was born in Toulouse. He's from the third generation. So how many generations will be needed not to mention the origin? I think the question of whether and how to include racial, religious, and ethnic description should be one of the most debated to fight stigma, uh, stigmatization of a community or a religion. And this comes really in echo with uh, some declaration made by Sarkozy one month ago to tell that in France we have too many foreigners and he's calling, he's really calling of a clash of civilization. Um, another observation concerns Sarkozy's declaration on, uh, on Thursday, last Thursday on television, and it was only two hours after the, uh, the death of Mera was announced. And it's, as usual, it's always very emotional with Sarkozy and the way he's doing this. And I think uh, I, I don't know why it wrote about it. So uh, this, uh, so Sarkozy wanted to take, wants to take tight measures to use the criminal law to crack down on people who visit a website. So it's the people who visit the website. Um, so it seemed quite impossible for Le Monde and Libération to implement uh, these kind of measures. And it was on the front page of uh, Le Monde and we had quite a uh, depth, uh, uh, I think, news and, and report about it. And Le Monde, so Le Monde, uh, the daily newspaper, which is quite, uh, um, well, good, I have to say good investigative journalist. And Le Monde, uh, the title was Internet Scapegoat de, uh, of Anti-Terrorism. And um, it's considered totally out of proportion for also, it was considered out of proportion for the press freedom group Reporter Without Borders. And it was really considered as a threat to investigative journalism, to academic and to researcher. As uh, also, to Aiden White told also in a, in a report uh, which is published by MDI, by Militza. And Le, the, uh, Le Monde also insisted, insisted to the need not to attack the wrong target. And Liberation also told one more time it is the internet who is being blamed as if internet was the sources of all evil. And also there was a, a parallel was done to the Patriot Act, Act in, um, in the USA. Um, I was also quite impressed by the role of the pictures in the front page of uh, different media. Uh, Le Monde would, um, would just have some photos just uh, since one or two years. So there were, were the same photos on the different newspaper, of course, because at the beginning there were not so many pictures. I brought a lot of photos, so for you, if some of you are interested, I can really have some, because some are quite interesting. Um, there. Can I just warn you that you've been going on for almost 10 okay, minutes? Okay, just, Thank uh, you. just, just two, two, two very brief. Uh, just in, uh, the treatment, I, I was quite interested to see the treatment between different newspapers. Le Parisien, which is a, a daily newspaper, 
very popular and, and a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of readers in the working press, working uh, uh, class, uh, was quite at, at quite a good uh, coverage of this and quite interesting. Uh, the last point will be the in political impact of, uh, of, of this drama. Will it be uh, in favor of Sarkozy, which is really now sticking to the National Front, or will it be uh, in favor of uh, the Socialist Party? So, of course, it's a big debate in France today. The security debate is a very complicated one, and we are less, as I mentioned before, less than four weeks of the presidential elections. So it's time now to have in the media a real public debate on French society, on our collective responsibility. Time to put in the debate the question of integration, of anti-discrimination and excluded area, which was not at all in the campaign up to now. So such a drama questions the whole society in France, but I think also in Europe and elsewhere. Thank you. I want to, to thank Claire actually for, for ag agreeing to talk about coverage of Toulouse because it, it's, as she said, a very hot issue, but we, I thought it would be very important that we actually talk about it because it's going to be around for quite a while, not only in France. Um, Claire mentioned internet and actually my, my last but not the least um, uh, panelist, uh, uh, George Lakatosh, is going also to talk a bit about uh, how difficult it is actually to regulate the internet. Um, George is, uh, is the director of uh, Roma Journalists Association uh, uh, in Romania, uh, which was established in 2009, and he's been ever since trying together with other similar uh, organizations to, to fight uh, particularly stereotypes and stigma against Roma people in Romania. And George will use another example, which I think is very interesting for those of you who are from Italy, how the media in Italy and Romania covered another case when a Roma person who, li who lived in, in, lives still in Italy, I think, uh, and who killed an Italian lady, and so how the media covered that, that, that uh, case in Italy and in Romania. George, please. Thank you. <clears throat> this distinguished participants, dear colleagues, Romania has 19 million people according to the latest census from last year. 11% of the population consists of 19 recognized ethnic minorities. Officially, the Hungarian minority is the largest with 1.2 million people. The second place being taken by the Roma minority with 619,000 people. As regards the estimate of number of Roma by the Roma themselves, as well as endorsed by various sociological and demographic researches and studies, the figure points to 1.52 million Roma, making Romania to have the most Roma inhabitants in Europe. These estimates are also largely recognized by the intergovernmental and international organizations. Roma leaders claim that many Roma have not declared themselves as belonging to this minority at the last census due to various concerns including fearing from being discriminated, unfavorable treatments, exclusion, attitudes and acts of intolerance by the majorities. In the last 21 years since Romania has gone from communism to democracy, the subject Roma gypsies crows sold many newspapers and made TV audience records. On some issues, Roma, gypsies, crows sold better than sex, the unbeatable worldwide theme. To the success of this subject have greatly contributed the Romanian authorities from simple press office of the institutions to high-ranking representatives of the Romanian states as the president and ministers. Romania is probably the only country or among the very few ones in Europe where the press offices of some state institutions refers to the ethnicity of citizens. In the early 90s, the police press offices state in the Ver Press release that a gypsy stole, a gypsy made a public scandal, or a gypsy killed. Although Romania has 19 minorities inhabiting, only criminals belonging to the Roma minority were specified in the press releases. 
which reinforced the idea in the collective mentality according to the which in Romania only gypsies steal. After a series of protests by Roma NGOs, Romanian police was forced to stop using the amnesty of offenders in the press releases. In May 2007, speaking with his wife about a dark-skinned journalist, the current president, Traian Băsescu, used the expression stinky gypsy, which was sanctioned by the National Council for Combating Discrimination. In February 2010, in an official meeting with the French minister Pierre Lelouch, the ex-foreign minister Theodor Bakonski said about Roma that they are physiological criminals. Another ex-foreign minister, Adrian Cioreanu, said in 2007, with obvious reference to the Roma, I was thinking if we will somehow buy a plot of Egyptian desert and place there those who embarrass us. On September the 1st, 2010, ruling party deputy Silvi Priguana submitted to the Chamber of Deputies a bill that called for changing the word Roma with Tsigan, gypsy. Such statements have done nothing but provide extremist organization and radical nationalist-oriented political parties in Romania with the ammunition they needed to proliferate anti-Roma racist statements in the media and the TV sites. The most famous case of xenophobia in recent years, manifested in both press from Romania as well as from Italy, is the Mailat case. On October 31, 2007, the Romanian Roma Mailat Romulus was apprehended by the Italian police and accused of killing an Italian woman near a train station in Rome. Immediately after this incident, the press from Italy has exploded and the press from Romania followed its example. According to the monitoring conducted between November 1 to 10, 2007 by Media Monitoring Agency, in the case of the Romulus My Light, 80% of the analyzed articles in Romanian journalists have not respected the principle of presumption of innocence. Merely, the Romanian journalists found Roma guilty Roma Mailat guilty of damaging the image of Romania abroad. The study includes observations and comments that refer to situations where journalists have not respected the basic rules of journalism ethics, the presumption of innocence, the lack of association between crime and ethnicity, information that is not supported by data. The monitoring conducted by AMP has followed the electronic edition of three central newspapers of which to quality, Journalul Național and Evenimentul Zile, and the tabloid, Libertatea. Five days after the incident, new data in the investigation contradicted some of the stories made before by the journalist. The publication of the autopsy results on Tuesday, November the 5th, revealed that the victim was not raped as the Italian and Romanian press related on the conviction. Libertatea newspaper wrote that after the autopsy, it wasn't discovered any sign to indicate that Romulus Mailat raped Giovanna, as the Italian press has written. Although the articles from Evermento Zile have incriminated Mailat also for rape, the newspaper did not publish immediately the autopsy results which denied the thesis of the rape. At the present, one of the most dangerous means of promoting racism and incitement to racial hatred is represented by the internet. In Romania, there is a state institution which sanctions racism promoted by television. Unfortunately, there is no such an institution for newspapers and for the internet. Sheltered by a nickname, anyone can post on the website of a newspaper in Romania racist comments without being penalized in any way. This can be verified very easily just by entering on an article where it comes to Roma, gays, or Hungarians. I give you a few examples from this kind of uh, uh, comment, uh, racist commentaries. Something must be done with these two million Roma in our country. We cannot allow them to assimilate to our people, to pollute our veins with their blood. We must get right at them at all to the last, until they don't swallow us or destroy our people. India and Bangladesh deportation, if they don't want extermination, and that's it. 
they should be called as they are, gypsy. And if they could transfer anywhere but here, it will be even better. I will propose Bug, Siberia, India, Madagascar. Thank you very much. Well, George, gave, George gave us a lot of bad examples of journalism, how media do not actually combat, but actually pro push for, for hate speech and xenophobia. The floor is now yours. Um, I, don't want, I don't want to use my, my moderator's right to ask the first question, but um, there are two gentlemen over there, and, and then we have Miklos there. Uh, can we start with questions, and then we'll see whether each question to be answered immediately, or we can group them. Um, Mohamed, yeah? Mohammed and then P Peter and then Miklos. Okay, thank, you. thank you. I'll try to to make it short. Uh, two remarks: one on the on the on the Roma uh, situation. Just this week, there has been a biography of Nicolas Sarkozy published in France, and the author of this biography was interviewed on Saturday on mainstream television in France, and she was stating that uh, Nicolas Sarkozy did great uh, with the Roma, but he still didn't solve the problem meaning that all the stigmatization that he did in, uh, in, his, uh, in his presidency against the Roma, getting rid of the Roma as a whole, uh, as a whole population and stigmatizing as uh, perpetrators of crimes and petty crimes and, thief and theft, uh, it wasn't enough. We should do more on, uh, on that. And this is a typical example on how on national television, in mainstream TV in France, we can still uh, 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 have like anti-Roma speech without any opposition in, uh, in, in France. That was the first remark. Second, on, uh, on Claire's uh, intervention, I, I found it very interesting. And what we are trying to do now uh, with the Collective Against Islamophobia is take a certain distance and analyze in the public speech whether on political figures or media commentators the way uh, the belonging of Mohammed Merah to Islam has been instrumentalized to emphasize or to imagine a, a, a complete plot or a complete link between him and radical movements in, uh, in, in Islam to justify his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his action. Of course, at the moment, it's completely impossible, impossible to have kind of a decent, calm discussion on the issue uh, in the mainstream media in France. And as uh, Claire rightly pointed, uh, there, is a, there is the idea of expertise that is put forward in the media to justify that the, the public, uh, the public uh, speech is confiscated by pre-approved uh, uh, analysts, which are going to repeat over and over and over again whatever the government says. Thank you. Mohammed, this would Uh, my question is about, about how can we protect the dignity of the targeted minorities, either immig Muslim or non-Muslim immigrants or Roma people, so I would say especially those minorities who are visible, uh, different in visible ways than the majority. So how can we protect their dignity by facilitating counter speech by those minorities or with the participation of those minorities? Because one way to deal with it seems to be that how can we make the mainstream media to react nicely to, to portray those minorities uh, without prejudice and rather positively. But my question is, how do you see the ways to get those minorities very much included? Is it like minority community stations that, or mainstream media participation of minority people? Or I would suggest both, but I wonder what you think. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Miklos, Jean-Paul, Jean and Tamla, if you wanted, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is more statement and a question, but try to keep it short, and it barks back to the previous panel <laughs> um, as a watchdog, um, because connection with regulation. I fully agree with, uh, with um, every keynote speaker who stressed the importance of uh, looking, into, looking into 
self-regulatory rather than regulatory measures and also to look at politicians, not just at the media. I would like to just list very briefly some examples from Hungary. Only this week, last week, the major channel of public television put a fake documentary. To cut it short, it's a virulent hate speech documentary against Roma with the pretext of using one self-named Roma expert who is expleting the most virulent uh, cliches against Roma. So here is what they themselves say about themselves. Um, the far-right party, Jobbik, is an internet party. It has an internet um, um, newsreel which commemorates the the jubilee of both of birth and of death of, of, of Adolf Hitler. Um, and uh, I could just go on and on and on. Here is the most famous anti-Semite of Central Europe, Jolt Bayer, who is leading a 100,000 strong rally to support the government with the slogan, we won't be a colony. And uh, the guy is public with statement in his paper uh, saying um, um, the problem with the Jews is that they were not killed out all in 1919 by the white terror, etc., etc. My point is, Hungary's media regulation, the most strict um, probably in the whole of Europe, is all based on the pretext of fighting hate speech and they don't do absolutely anything, just the opposite. It's vir virulently present. The only thing they do is they ban the only independent radio. The only thing they do is sanction one, one, there was one case of sanctioning, trying to sanction hate speech. It was an internet remark about the president of the republic, not about the Roma and not about, not about um, uh, the, uh, the Jews, it was one irreverent comment um, on the website of, a, of, a, of an opposition newspaper. My point is, same about France, just was mentioned, it happened, this, this awful killing spree happened in France where even sentiments are being criminalized. Even sentiments, not just statements, and not just uh, not just uh, imminent danger cases. Here is Slovakia, Milo mentioned Slovakia. In the previous attempt of the Fico slaughter government at the press law, my previous office um, negotiated them out of one chapter of the press law with, which listed a, a Guinness Book of Record 18 type of hatred that a newly set up um, Department of the Cultural Ministry, ministry under, under, under Mr. Majaric would sanction. Now they abolished from the draft that chapter, but they introduced, as Milos said, the extremism case, a la Russia, a la Belarus, etc. They have now extremism set up under the famously racist Slaughter and Fizzo coalition, and it's still there in the. My point is. Self-regulatory methods only, and looking at the state of politics, how politics is driving. Um, the, yeah, my final example is exactly Bashescu. He was sanctioned, and it made it made him only more. He is still still the president, and and um, and made him only more popular. My point is. Uh, Miklos I'm sorry. My point is, we are having. You've had case several of, points. We are having the case of Hungary already. None of you who have met the authority in Hungary would have missed the point. We have set up this in order to fight hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, Miklos, for your six points. Um, before I give a floor to Jean Paul and other um, who want to contribute, uh, Anne wanted to answer the question how media can be more inclusive and give a voice, uh, include particularly visible minorities, as someone said. Anne, please. 
So you think I have the answer then? <laughs> well, um, I, have to, I have some thoughts around the topic. Um, uh, in Norway, the integration is, uh, well, we have our challenges, although Norway is a financial stable country in many ways, but we have had some difficulties with integration. The problem with the journalists in Norway is that they're considered as left-wing liberals and that our uh, reporting around uh, immigration is issues and integration issues has not been considered trustworthy. Uh, and that's a problem, I think, uh, because we have to, uh, as journalists, report also, um, uh, we have to report all the aspects of life. Um, and uh, we have to also report about problems concerned integration, but we have to do that in a trustworthy and a sane way. And we have to do that without using the stereotypes. So if there has been a rape by a Muslim man, uh, this is not a problem uh, for Muslims, it's a problem for that man. Uh, and that's the way we have to kind of treat that, uh, that thing. We have to make the individual stories. And, as to, uh, and I also think it's very important with, uh, 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 with a, um, a, a correct representation in media. We have a problem in Norway, too many white reporters, um, uh, middle class, uh, same education, everything. That's a big problem. So we're now trying in our company to be more specific in our recruitment. And we need role models, and we need reporters from, uh, from all of the society. We need reporters from all ethnic backgrounds and also different class backgrounds, because class is also an issue here. So having actually a diverse newsroom helps actually diversify the content. I think so, yes. It helps a lot. Um, Irina wants to, to, to make a comment. Claire, if you have something, yes. Uh, we have also asked our journalists uh, whom we inv interviewed in the Mediva project about uh, this uh, issue and we saw that the problem is that uh, uh, the majority of media coverage on migration and minorities in general is reported in the news format. And for example, editorial articles on the matter and uh, investigative or background stories are nearly uh, non-existent. So our response to that would be that in order not to uh, have questions how we can protect the dignity of minorities, it's not a one-day event that tomorrow <laughs> will uh, present it all nicely. It's, um, I think it's routine uh, work of journalists. And also journalists gave another response that uh, the migration topic and the minority topic in general is a very delicate issue. And that's why if they want to have uh, migrants or um, representatives of minorities talk to them, they have to build trust uh, with uh, uh, the migrant or minority communities. And uh, in, only in this case they can count also on the um, on the correctness of the information with which they are provided. And I think another th point is that uh, training within the media outlets is extremely important and we have seen that in many countries it's nearly non-existent. And that's why the idea and there is very little awareness among the journalists uh, of the importance of the diversity topic in general, at least in the countries that we have had under our analysis. So training for journalists and also somehow we journalists go to, if we talk about ethnic religious minorities, only when we want to talk about that particular uh, issue, but we don't include them, members of these communities, when we discuss any issues relevant for the whole society and being uh, of different uh, color or speaking different language from uh, mainstream population doesn't mean that I am not interested in new pension scheme or a new uh, uh, tax law, things like that. So including members of vulnerable, uh, marginalized groups in any debate uh, important for the whole society. Yeah. Thank you. Matter of fact, it's just, um, just a very small comment. We have analyzed, uh, for example, the presence of the views of migrants uh, or in mainstream news, and we saw that it was non-existent, basically. So that's why it just maybe in migrant-related news, some views are aired, but not in mainstream news at all. Uh, Claire wanted to say something, then we'll go uh, Jean-Paul, Tadlak, Barbara, and then someone here. Yes, um, uh, 
uh, well, just to, to add something concerning training, I think there is formal training and there is also informal training. And this can be done uh, in workshops. And I think what is quite important is uh, this kind of training or workshops to have together ac research, academic researchers, media people, NGOs, civil society, and uh, if possible, institutions. <coughs> Um, uh, training, something perhaps positive in France, is uh, the possibility given to integrate in the school of journalism. Young journalists now coming from diverse origin, or is it so and social, special and ethnic origin. So now there is a, a real, there is a bit of awareness, I have to say, since some years, and especially since the riots we got in France in 2005. So now it could be interesting to know if the shocks we got in France uh, six years ago and the result in the media. At that time, Chirac really was shocked to see how, what was the, the coverage in the press of those riots so, and the awareness. So there were some measures which were, were taken and some were implemented, some were not. So it could be interesting to know, to look at what's going on now. Um, and of course, employment is very important. And the selling glass in women also, we didn't talk about the women, but the women, have, there are a lot of problems in the, uh, on visibility. And of course, portrayal, as uh, Mohammed uh, just spoke before. So I don't want to, just to give more information, but I will be very pleased to share my opinions with uh, colleagues. Thanks, Claire. Uh, we'll go for a group of comments and questions, Jean-Paul, Tarlok, and Barbara, and then we'll go back to the panelists. Yes, uh, after hearing what I'm going to say, you might believe that I'm, I'm working for a committee to protect the reputation of journalists. Uh, it's, it's, uh, no, I just wanted to highlight one issue, is the question of responsibility of proprietors and editors-in-chief and all that, because uh, I've been involved in uh, many projects, global projects on migration, and we, we put together for a couple of years ago a series of uh, transnational projects together with journalists from Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, the Maghreb, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, and it led to the publication of a manual of the coverage of mi uh, migration. What we discovered at that moment, when we were working with the, uh, the, the media, uh, and I don't like the word the media because it tends to put together so many different animals, I would say that what happened is that basically we were only able to invite to our training sessions or to our workshops uh, people from the usual suspect, the best and the brightest, if I may say, uh, of every country in, uh, from which we were inviting journalists. We had, I mean, in France, for instance, we had... Uh, Radio France Internationale, we had Le Monde, we had Le Parisien, which is a popular, sort of a respectable paper. But we were ne never able to, to invite other news organizations that tended to be seen as going very close always to the borderline, to the crossing the red lines. And it's really an issue. I mean, the, how do we engage the proprietors and, and the, in the editors-in-chief? And very often, I mean, I have been to hundreds of meetings like this, and I haven't seen many, many editors. I haven't met, seen many, many publishers. It's different from the States, for instance. In the US, the Publishers Association has been on the vanguard in, in, in trying to push the question of diversity in their own companies. It's not the case in Europe. I mean, very few news organizations in Europe uh, seem to be uh, interested as employers, uh, as their strategic editorial project uh, to send their staff to training, because it's, no, it's, it's no use. I mean, if you always work with the people that have the, the least to learn from, from, from the training sessions. In, for instance, in Morocco, we had, I mean, a few journalists from the best uh, independent newspapers, but the others from, the, from some state newspapers, from some private papers that were always on the wrong side when it came to racism against the sub-Saharan Africans, they were not allowed to take part. You know, to, to, to those sessions, well, no, it doesn't interest us. It's too much money, made, you know, lo losing time. So I guess we have to understand something that uh, we are in a world where the media is divided. I mean, between uh, employers uh, or proprietors that have, I think, uh, a vision of their responsibility, and others that consider stigmatization as a business model. It's part of their business model. I mean, and it's, we have to understand that. And so when I see, I, I really appreciated the. Uh, the, the survey on the media, 
but again, I will say the media, I don't think about the media. We have to definitely, if, if, especially if we want to engage journalists, to stop seeing the media as just one compact mass, and then we draw conclusions. We are in a complete different, we are in a highly fragmented world when it comes to the media. And I think that we should try definitely to to push some proprietors and it is in chief uh, to come to those kinds of sessions. And I'm very happy to, to see that uh, uh, Aidan White is involved with the Global Editors Network because it's, it's, I know that the message will go at least through some of these editors in chief. Thanks, Jean Paul. Thank you. Um, also to Jean Paul for doing the hard work uh, in presenting the first point that I wanted to, uh, to make, namely that tendency to amalgamate the media uh, into one. <clears throat> If you look at the question of participation of uh, minorities in the media uh, um, from a very functional perspective, it's, it's, it's important to, to distinguish between the different um, types of media and different roles that they play in order to maximize um, the involvement of minorities in, in the media. Even if you take two very big and rough categories, for example, mainstream and uh, minor, so-called minority media, there are huge differences uh, between what they can and, and, and do achieve. Uh, minority media would play a very important function for communication within a particular group, insofar as that group is uh, coherent and homogenous. Uh, on the other hand, the ability of minority groups to participate in mainstream uh, my, uh, media plays a, 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 an alternative but nonetheless very important function. Namely, it facilitates uh, uh, the ability to present their own narratives and perspectives in a more mainstream, uh, often national uh, debate. So I think whenever you're, you're trying to uh, devise strategies uh, for promoting uh, minority, minorities' involvement in the media, it's important to have a, a, a broad package of differentiated strategies that will very much home in and on and pursue specific objectives. The second brief point that I wanted to make um, will pick up on the term visible minorities. Now, I don't want to seem pedantic, but it, I think it's important to move away from that term. It's a term that doesn't have any anchorage in um, international human rights standards. And I think that if it is to be introduced into political discourse, it could prove problematic. Um, the reason is that some of the minorities who are in greatest need of protection and promotion um, are not very visible. Um, not all religious minorities, for example, will necessarily be visible, nor will linguistic minorities or other minorities uh, who are primarily defined in terms of gender, identity, and whatnot. It's also very important to bear in mind that even minorities that would be primarily classed as ethnic or national they also uh, have uh, overlapping identities. There are many things at once, and that's something that has traditionally been missed in, in, in policy discourse. It's very important not to compartmentalize uh, different minorities, but to look at how um, participation can be maximized at all stages of uh, media activities, not just news reporting, but also um, editorial decisions, decisions uh, for commissioning programs, in the case of audiovisual media, that can have a crucial impact on um, uh, improving uh, media participation in the media. Thank you. We often talk about minorities, even though some communities are definitely not minority, at least not by number, such as women, but that's, that is another issue. Bar Please. Thank you. I actually wanted to make a comment about the diversity at the, at the workforce and then also about uh, presenting minorities or migrants as a monolithic uh, group. But they, those have been mentioned, but um, so I, I will not add anything to that. But I wanted to, in terms of measures and how we can involve minorities more in the mainstream media or giving more prominence to minority media, one also interesting project or aspect which Article 19 has been looking at is an experience of uh, truth and reconciliation commissions, which has happened uh, in many African countries and has given prominence to victims in terms of not being presented as statistics or stories, but giving them a unique form of having their voices heard as a human beings. And I think that we can look into this experience and there has been looked in this experience through the use of new media. 
and uh, how they can present the, the victims or like, you know, what we consider victims with their part of the story and how their stories are told. And um, as I said, that these are explored mostly in African countries where huge atrocities happen, but they have been explored in, in Europe recently. For instance, there is a very interesting project in Sweden called Living History Forum, Living History Forum, which is a cooperation of media houses, uh, trade unions, employers, journalists and civil society organizations that work with LGBT groups. Uh, and it's, it's a platform and also a cooperation with the ombudsman for sexual uh, minor um, LGBT groups. So this can be also one of the way how to look uh, for giving the victims the platform uh, to express their positions and voices. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Marie, and then I'll ask my panelists if they have anything to add at this point. Yeah, no, thank you to Jean-Paul for the reality check. Very important uh, point that uh, there are commissioning editors and decision makers who, who, who decide about uh, diversity. And I wanted to ask the question uh, as, as a second part of the reality check, do we have a successful business for diversity model? Um, do, we, do we make a pound? Do we make a buck? Uh, when we decide to address what your study has identified as that Europe is made up of diverse nations and citizens, but most national or public uh, media do not adequately reflect that diversity. Panelists, any comments from you at this point? Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Yes, please, Irina. <coughs> Uh, my experience also from my doctoral thesis, because I was doing uh, language rights, uh, in the me including in the media, and also now from this uh, project that it's, of course, also depends on, uh, the for example, the migration pattern that the country has. We have been studying countries with different migration patterns. If you take uh, the Netherlands, for example, and uh, you take a country like Italy, so Netherlands with a rich history of migration, there you see sort of now fatigue towards this uh, issue, whereas in Italy, for example, the country with, uh, we can say, recent uh, migration uh, history, you see that there is little awareness, actually, of, of the need to actually present the problem, and that's why we see different approaches also. If in Italy, for example, there are no at all courses on, uh, uh, for instance, diversity, offered to journalists. You see that in the Netherlands, uh, respectful newspapers would have even a diversity department, uh, so that would take care of uh, organizing courses within the uh, newspapers. I think that it, it, it very much depends on also on the country you talk about. If we take Poland, our partner said that, uh, you know, uh, in Poland there, is, <laughs> there, is, there are so very few migrants that you can't pretend that, for example, migrants, uh, th there will be a special policy of a newspaper to employ migrants, etc. So I think it very much depends also on the numbers, of course, and uh, uh, also with regard to national minorities and all this. I think it's, um, it's, it's very relative, although we said media in general, but uh, we have different pictures in different countries. Thank you, Irina. Before I, I ask Aidan to, uh, to talk, um, you have in your materials media for diversity uh, recommendations, but this is a part of the study where actually we listed 30 examples of business case for diversity in the EU, uh, maybe worth uh, looking at, at that. Aidan, please. Yes, I'm mean, just very briefly to answer a couple of, the, uh, to talk about just a couple of the points. Um, I mean, we are in Italy. I mean, I just want to sort of correct the idea that, that actually nothing has, or very little has been done in Italy on this question. I mean, it's very important to bear in mind that actually it's only a few years ago that editors and journalist organizations here in Italy actually got together for the very first time to agree a specific charter called the Charter of Rome, which was actually to give ideas and thoughts to media about how to deal with reporting uh, migration issues, particularly after a, a horrifying uh, incident in which there was a murder and the media took it 
it up and it was very bad. And, and, and the question might come up, which I think would be valid, to say, well, what happened after you signed the Charter of Rome? You know, where's the monitoring and where's the review? And I think that is actually a very important part of this process, is that very often we, get, we are able to sign ourselves onto declarations and statements that aspire to do good things, but what we don't do is attach to it commitment to actually follow it up with practical actions and certainly not review and monitoring, which, which I think is, is, is essential. Now, the question has been asked here, which I think is absolutely right, which is quite, where's the business model? And, and, and I think that there's a massive problem here. There's a great gap that exists between the aspirations for good journalism, good regulatory sort of uh, frameworks and so on, much more inclusive reporting and so on, and the reality that resources are not being made available by media organizations um, just to, to, to be able to spend the time on money which is necessary to actually get background. When Claire talks about uh, there, there, there is no time for verification and you have people lifting things off other channels without sort of verifying it and so on, that is driven by a resources question. It's also driven by a cultural question of reporting instant news which doesn't allow for proper ethical reflection. So the, the, the question is the business model. My view about it is, is that actually I don't think the private sector is going to be able to make money out of this form of news reporting. So I don't think we can expect any time soon great amounts of money to be invested by corporations or media corporations in this area of work. And if that's not going to happen, then we have to ask seriously the question about where do we find those resources. And it seems to me that opens up a discussion about do we have uh, the, the proper commitment from the agencies of the state and public authorities to ensure that these, this crisis of information or lack of information is, is properly addressed. I mean, the question of actually a appointment of people into newsrooms is right, diversity in newsroom is very important, but actually unless it's part of a cultural shift within the entire organisation, not just about appointing one or two people, because as some of your journalists pointed out, very often this is just seen as tokenism and doesn't have any impact on the internal culture. So there has to be a sort of a generalised strategy and so on, and this requires investment. And it seems to me, therefore, we have to be looking for a completely new approach to funding public service value in media, which, is, which is requires a recognition that rights-based journalism, that is journalism which takes account of standards and rights, actually requires public investment and so on. And, and, and I think that is very, very important. And it, it, it will only happen, it seems to me, if we can get into the top of the media pyramid as well as the bottom of the media pyramid. We always want to we make sure that journalists are doing good work so we have lots of training sessions to help them do the good work. Then they go back to newsrooms and they're told something completely different by editors and news editors who are driving the news agenda. But at the top of the media pyramid, which is the owners and editors and as Jean-Paul says, these are the people we have to bring to the table because these are the people in the end, if we can get them convinced that they should accept conditions of, for receiving public money to ensure that their journalism is rights-based. We can make them part of a process of trying to redefine that whole question of funding and in the media landscape. And in my view, in, in the short and medium term, unless there is some strategic view which is moving in that direction, I don't think we're going to get much progress at all. I think Aidan concluded my session, um, which is nice. Thank you, Aidan. Um, where, how do we get these media decision makers? As you know, Aidan, we just did something in, in Egypt and it's so difficult in, in the European Union getting so-called unconverted, non-converted media decision makers to sit together with people like us here and look for the solutions. Um, I, I think it's time now for lunch. Uh, we can uh, continue discussing uh, these issues um, over the lunch or later on, but training and probably, if I understood Aidan well, you know, someone else apart from media organizations, such as European Union and other organizations which can support, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, not events, but like pushing editors to do if they think they should do it. Because the question is still, why should I bother? Why should I bother to include minorities, to include migrants? We have to convince them that there is um, social uh, or commercial interest uh, for them to, to be more inclusive. With this, I want to thank my panelists particularly, then uh, uh, all of you who contributed and all of you who listened to it, and see you at the lunch. Thank you.